respected audience respected panelists our advisory and technical teams good evening shishurveti pashurveti veti ganarasam fanihi music is a lullaby to little babies soporific for sulking souls inkilap to impatient intellectuals adumu or the masai jumping dance for the simple folks to enjoy a dalliance with dafli the dappu to a madiga untouchable or a virah geeta for a love lorn and infinite other rupas it is not merely the diversity of forms but the profundity of purpose purposeless joy and philosophical and spiritual inner journey is this diversity of form and purpose along with their freedom of expression in worse peril now than any time in the past the assassinations of kalburgi gauri lankesh and others a political leader is called to murder the poet and lyricist vairamuttu trolling threatening and foisting cases against comedian kunal kamra are only the tip of the iceberg is it the need of the hour that we should extol the virtues of diversity more vehemently now i don't know but our learned learned panelists dr nagaraja rao havaldar and professor sumangala damodaran will surely throw good light on the subject i request the enthusiastic audience to post their queries gold medalist in ma and holder of sangeet ratna degree and doctorate in music from karnataka university dr nagaraja rao havaldar is a leading hindustani classical vocalist from bengaluru he was trained under pandit bhimshen joshi's disciple pandit madhava gudi of kirana gharana and pandit panchakshari swami mattigatti in the jaipur atrauli gharana he quit all india radio in 1991 to focus on music but remained as the grade a artist with air and dd a pioneer in the kannada khayal by adapting the 12th century vachanas of shiva sharanas dr havaldar with t n sitaram produced dd tele series ragadhare his another dd series swaradhare produced by ajim premji university presents the biographies of some of karnataka's music greats he is the founder president of sunada art foundation bengaluru he rendered bhagavad gita in kannada he made an album for nimhans research on music therapy and also performed at tihar jail a prolific writer dr havaldar published khayal and devotional compositions many books and articles in leading kannada magazines his column anuraga in the paper hi bangalore is very popular selected articles from this column are published as swara sannidhi his english and kannada semi biographical work on bharat ratna pandit bhimshen joshi is a classic he was appointed member of the first core committee sikkim sikkim central university trustee mp government's bharat bhavan expert committee member ministry of culture government of india chairman hindustani music textbook committee karnataka government and academic council member indian music experience bengaluru he was a visiting professor in 2011 chicago amherst university and a guest teacher at bharati vidya bhavan london he widely travels for concerts and lectures in india usa uk and canada he performed in the world kannada conferences 2002 and 2006 world music festival 2010 world veerashaiva conference london international arts festival hampi utsav and mysore dasara fest festival dr havildar's whole family including his two sons and nephew serve the cause of music his devotion to music won him many awards such as sangeet ratna at salt lake music festival kolkata panchakshari gavai memorial award mysore nirmana purandhara sangeet ratna bengaluru vishwakala sangha award chennai karnataka state kala shri award pandit bhimshen joshi smriti puraskar 2023 thanks a lot sir for accepting our invitation and we are privileged to have you i now request you sir dr nagaraja rao havaldar to speak thanks for this anek uh, dara uh, congregation i know that i am talking to a very very learned set of audience and uh, very very mature citizens of the country uh, it's my privilege to be sharing my experience 
uh, as you rightly said, Sishur Vaiti, Pashur Vaiti. Uh, going a step further, Shakespeare says, if king loud music, there will be no violence in the country. And uh, it is, I am a student of history and archaeology to begin with. So they say wars begin in the minds of men. Wars begin in the minds of men. Of course, it's not gender specific anymore. Wars can begin also in the minds of women too. But what it says is any turmoil, any disorder, any disharmony, it basically starts in the mind. And if there is anything that can uh, really occupy your mind fruitfully, positively, uh, that is the music. So I'm extremely uh, fortunate to belong to this uh, very, very minuscule community, uh, which uh, strongly believes in practicing, propagating this great, great art form. Uh, come to think of uh, the, the diversity and the synthesis and the diversity as the caption for today's talk says, maybe uh, it was, of course, for me, it was quite a lengthy introduction about myself, uh, uh, but I'm sorry about that. Mm. But you could see that uh, I have sung in World Music Conference, I have sung in Tihar Jail, I have sung for Nimhans, so on and so forth. So just with the help of these seven notes, I'm able to cater to the needs of those many people across, across the state and the country. So uh, what I have noticed is uh, like uh, by and large, uh, the common man, I'm not referring to the word common man in the context of social welfare. The common man thinks that classical music has probably come from somewhere it belongs to a particular section of the society. It's pursued and practiced and taught and handed over to by one particular section to another, so on and so forth. I want to politely beg to differ with that view. For example, there is something called as knowing the known and knowing the unknown. Uh, what happens is I'm sure uh, all of us or most of us would have heard this chant, which goes like this. Mm -hmm. Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya. If you give this to a classical musician, he will say, Nisari, Nisari sa, Nisari, Nisari sa, Rutyorma, Sari ma. So I can go on. Translating all those words into notation, that's on the one side. And I can also say that it originates from Rag by Ragi Bhaira, one of the famous uh, ragas. But I am sure most of you in your family, your forefather, you, your aunt, your uncle, they might be singing this shloka and you may be humming this shloka also without, without your own knowledge. Only thing that you don't know is the name of this tune is Rag by Ragi Bhairav, otherwise you actually know the tune. So therefore I uh, strongly believe that uh, music being a intuitive and instinctive art form, everybody or most of us do tend to uh, tilt towards music, we love it, we like it, we hum it. And music starts at uh, three different levels, one is imitation, you listen to a lovely song and you tend to imitate that. Then uh, it stays at repetition. You keep repeating the same tune or the same long, same song over a period of time. That is repetition. The third stage is creation, provided you go to a good group, wonderful group. So imitation, repetition, creation, there is a process involved, there is an effort involved. Uh, in fact, yesterday I was talking to my learned friends. In fact, I, I do notice that. Uh, some of you have worked in Indian Railways. I should thank Indian Railways uh, for a different reason. When my Paramaguru, Madhavadi's guru, and Bhimsen Gushi, when he left the house in search of a guru at the age of 11, he was a ticketless traveler in Indian Railways. And uh, whenever the TTE, the ticket, in, ticket travel examiner, that's what you call them, he asked for a ticket, he would sing a song for them. 
एंड पंडित जी वुड टेल मी व्हेन आई हैड अ कॉन्वर्सेशन विद हिम अगर वो टीटी सुर में होता तो मुझे ट्रैवल करने देता अगर वो बेसरा होता तो ही वुड किक मी आउट ऑफ द ट्रेन देन ही वुड वेट फॉर वन मोर ट्रेन एंड ही विल वेट फॉर वन मोर टीटी ही वुड लाउड म्यूजिक टू एनी एक्सटेंड पॉसिबल दैट्स हाउ हिज जर्नी कंटिन्यूड टुवर्ड्स अ ग्रेट गुरु एट द एंड ऑफ द डे but what i'm trying to say he, here is like uh, if music can inspire a 11 year old boy to leave the house give him all the courage to go in search of a guru and at the end of the day at the end of his career become a bharat ratna one of the highest coveted civilian honors that anybody can get in their life you can see the the strength the value the power of music there and in fact i keep <coughs> sorry i keep telling uh one of the single most disciplines wherein bharat ratna has been conferred upon is music though i have enormous respect for all the disciplines and all the bharat ratnas that our country has seen and produced for from different uh, disciplines different services so bhimsen joshi subalakshmi ravi shankar lata mangeshkar and bismillah khan sir and uh, i also strongly feel that many many more would have deserved it and well uh, uh, those who award it have their own considerations over a period of time let us not go into that part of it but come to think of come to think of this bharat ratnas uh only pandit ravi shankar ji went up to the college up to pc level then he became so busy as an artist that uh, he took to music full time and he became an epitome of indian classical music all over the globe uh, in fact i myself and pandit vishwamohan but who is also one of the trustees at bar bhavan bhopal he was telling me that when he was walking in the streets of new york mr vishwamohan banji one of the local person looked at him oh indian you are an indian he said yes i am ravi shankar ravi shankar he said so that's the kind of the recognition that this uh, great artist get us across the country so uh, ravi shankar ji comes from bengal bhim singh joshi ji though his name ends as joshi but he is actually uh, called as joshi in maharashtra he is from karnataka bismillah khan sahab from uttar pradesh subalakshmi ji from down south so there is still a synthesis but there's still a diversity and uh, how come that uh, there are only seven notes in the entire universal music not just indian classical music we call it as uh, i'm sure dr sarumangala ji and most of you know know this i don't have to necessarily explain but still a quick uh, demonstration would be mm, सरे गि सोरे नीपिंग दिस काम फॉर एज अ रेफरेंस इवन इफ आई सिंग सम स्वर आस आई एम शूर यू बी एबल टू रिलेट दट द सॉन्ग ga 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 pa sa re ga ma 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 pa pa ga re sa ga 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 pa sa re ga ma 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 pa pa ga re sa yeah excluding the qualified musician who is there on the panel i want somebody else to tell me which tune this recalls you anybody can answer this question i don't want dr sumangla ji to answer this <laughs> jingle bell sir yeah absolutely jingle bell so a western tune can be transcribed or translated in, into an indian swara group and vice versa so in indian context we call shuddha and komal swaras and in the west they call it as flat and sharp so if they, the the human society has not discovered eighth note across the globe the only eighth note that the, that the human society has discovered is the currency which loses its value once across the border 
whereas all these musical notes are highly uh, standardized. So therefore, we, we call our classical music as a scientific art and an artistic science. I repeat, our classical music is a scientific art and an artistic science because once I say Rag Bhairav, or which is Maya Maharagoda in the Carnatic system, it remains Bhairav whether you are singing in Chennai or Hyderabad or Delhi. Or when you say Rag Bhairav, it's the same in California, Hubli and Banaras, for example. Mm. So if I go to California and ask a harmonium player to play with me without any prior acquaintance, without any prior practice, Raghairam, he knows what it is. And if I say Tikal, it is 16 bits. It's highly standardized, highly scientifically, melodically, aesthetically standardized. So he knows what to play. So isn't it uh, synthesis in diversity? No matter where you stay, it is highly standardized. So therefore, uh, I'm sure you might have heard a very popular song based on Bhairav. Sundar Shah Hamaretum. In Karnataka, you could see the Lamulane Tantosha So, same Sarekama Padanisa, diverse in its approach, diverse in its lyric, but it is synthesized, it is uniform in the melody and the emotional part of it. Uh, so therefore, no matter which dharana I belong to, that's one big question that we face in the contemporary society. So as a student of both history and archaeology on the one side, and as an art historian and as a student of music, I can say that uh, no dharana is complete in itself. I repeat, no dharana is complete in itself and no dharana is superior to other dharana. They all practice the same swaras, they all practice and sing in the same dharas. They just developed in different pockets and a different patronage. Therefore, they thought that their style was something very unique and exclusive. Otherwise, they are not necessarily superior or different from anybody else. So that's how, again, the diversity of the dharanas. It's like looking at the temples in Hampi in Vijayanagara, my native town. They are made out of granite. So the granite as a stone does not allow you for very, very minute carvings. So therefore they built huge temples. They built a huge statue of Ganesha and called it as Kadle Kad Ganesha, Saswe Kad Ganesha. And when you come to the temples of Belur and Halabi, again belonging to Hoysala period, they built the temples in soapstone, which lends themselves for very, very minute carving. So therefore, uh, they came up with the wonderful, very minute carvings and temples or Shila Malikas uh, and so on and so forth. But uh, iconographically or mythologically, they don't differ. If you go to a Rama temple in Hampi, Rama has a bow and arrow, and so is in a Hoysala temple or so in a temple. Or just because I'm a different ruler in a different geographical region, I cannot give flute to Rama and I cannot give the musical swaras. They interpret it. Classical music remains as one single unifying unit and, and it is highly synthesized. The diversity part is pretty much there. For example, uh, there is one uh, not very really popular theater song from Maharashtra, that is Chandrika 
की जनु चंद्रिका की जनु श्रीपति मोहन पाही मेवानित बांधवा सो मच गिवन पे बिटवीन Languages, the cultures, so there is unity and there is synthesis. Oh, I can, in fact, um, twenty twenty-five minutes to talk about uh, classical music uh, is really really challenging. Uh, probably, uh, I will do one thing now. Uh, I was saying in the beginning of my talk that uh, some section of the society belongs to. There is a, we have branded it to. Something very aristocratic or so on and so forth. No, Bhimsen Joshi was the son of a teacher. Malikarjun Mansur was the son of a farmer. Kumar Gandhar was the son of a goldsmith. Bismillah Khan Sahib did, did not come from a royal family. So did uh, uh, Gangubai Handelji, for that matter. She came from a Devadasi family. M S G came from a very very modest family. M S Samma Vasant. You take the names. None of them came from royal families. They came from a very very humble family, but their music was royal. Their music was very rich. And um, the very inherent for society. I'll give a small example. Uh, one Dr. Karanath, another wonderful solo player from Karnataka. He was traveling from. Uh, Bangalore to uh, which is the rag you are asking, rag Durga, the ones I sang previously. Uh, once uh, Rajiv Tarana was traveling from Bangalore to Delhi via Pune, thanks to Indian railways, so many railway employees are here. Uh, so there was a 12-hour gap between. And uh, this anecdote goes back by 30, 40 years, or maybe slightly more. Uh, <coughs> sorry. So he went to a public coin booth and gave a call to Pandit Bhim Singh Joshi's house. Uh, he wanted to know if Pandit Joshi was there. He would go and seek his blessings. So he calls up Pandit Joshi's house, and uh, his good fortune, Pandit Joshi was at home because Bhim Singh Joshi was also called as Hawaii Gandharva. His guru was Hawaii Gandharva. Bhim Singh Ji was called Hawaii Gandharva because every alternative would be in the flight, going to Kolkata, Bombay, Delhi, USA, name it, and he would be there. So like that, uh, Bhim Singh Ji was at home, and he said, "Oh, Rajiv, come to my house. Come. Both of us will eat food. Your train is at night. Come and sit down." So Rajiv Tarana Ji comes out of the railway station and goes to the auto rickshaw driver. Uh, देखिए हमको भीमसेन जोशी का घर जाना है वो गाना गाते हो ही भीमसेन जोशी है ना तो आई एम मेकिंग दिस ऑब्जर्वेशन विद मोस्ट रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी आई डोंट से दैट ऑटो रिक्शा ड्राइवर शुड नॉट और कैन नॉट एंजॉय म्यूजिक ही डज ही हैज एवरी राइट टू एंजॉय दिस सो ही न्यू हु भीमसेन जोशी वाज तो इधर वो गाना गाते हुए हम ऑफ कोर्स आई नो इज आवर साइल टेक इट So classical musician does not belong to any particular section. He belongs to everybody. But the senator does not end, end there. So he, the auto rickshaw driver, promptly brings Rajiv Tarnath Ji to the Pandit Ji's house, and Rajiv Tarnath wants to pay the auto rickshaw driver. Then the auto rickshaw driver gets wild. क्या आप अपने आप को बहुत अमीर समझते हैं? You think that you are the only rich man in this country? You want me to accept fee for this service? No. Bhim Singh Ji is the pride of our nation. is the pride of the country i listen to his abhangs every day on a daily basis so therefore i cannot accept any fee for this service i will take bhim singh ji's ashirwad and go away. so this is the type of impact that the musicians leave on the society no matter where you belong to so with that one marathi abhang i'll conclude my monologue probably i'll i'll be able to answer few questions Thank <laughs> you.
देव विठल देव पूजा विठल देव विठल देव पूजा विठल तीर्थ विठल क्षेत्र विठल तीर्थ विठल क्षेत्र विठल माता विठल पिता विठल बंधु विठल गोत्र विठल देव विठल देव पूजा विठल तीर्थ विठल क्षेत्र विठल गुरु विठल गुरु देवता विठल गुरु विठल गुरु देवता विठल निधान विठल निरंतर विठल तीर्थ विठल क्षेत्र विठल नमन माधे विठल सापड़ नमन माधे नम बड़े माधे नम बड़े माधे नम बड़े माधे नम बड़े माधे विठल सापड़ मनु कड़ी काड़ा पाड़ी पाड़ी तीर्थ विठल क्षेत्र विठल तीर्थ विठल क्षेत्र विठल थैंक यू नाउ दाउस लोगो फॉर क्वेश्चन आई होप आई हैव आंसर to most of your questions don't think that i am an encyclopedia nor google the first question is yeah how can music help us unite in the face of the various fissiporous tendencies tearing at the fabric of our nation actually relating to this uh, one more question is there uh, in fact many questions are related to this if for example one more question is a most famous devotional song man tadpat har darshan was written music composed and sung by artists whom we never considered muslims but universal artists yeah pandit bismillah khan was playing shehnai in varanasi on ganga as devotedly as any nayanar would have okay but now everything including a hungry belly is asked what label is yours what must have caused this perversion and how can music heal this perversion well uh, this looks more like a political question <laughs> rather than just a musician but uh, let me tell you uh, uh, pandit bhimsen joshi's guru was savai gandharva and savai gandharva's guru was abdul karim khan saha and abdul karim khan would take a seven year old seven year bond from a student saying that he or she would learn music from him uh, continuously for seven years then only he would teach that's part one so i am asking this question from a musician's view point one of my other guru ji is pandit panchashri madhigatti who learned from another guru called pandit nivrutti govasarna so the the cultural compulsion of a guru is not to just teach the scale or the tada he also has to impart the culture he also also take care of the shishya he also has to feed him and uh, panchashri madhigatti belonged to a jangama community and nivrutti bhuva sarai was a kshatriya so they were non vegetarian eaters the shishya was not was a purely vegetarian eater but the guru was so sensitive to that he bought a new set of vessels for the sake of the student so one day in a week he would feed him so in that particular day he would use only those vessels which were dedicated for the student they would never cook anything else in those vessels so these kind of incidents have been there in the field of music uh, so musicians per se they are not into these kind of uh, uh, compartment compartments given an opportunity we would rather explain these things and bring the community together so that's what in fact yesterday i was discussing with uh, ravi babu and another gentleman who also served in railways why do you put these artists in d and c group why not 
at the top of the la la ladder. And allow them to work in the booking counter, not allow them to practice well. No, that should not be. If you want to support them, give them a job, give them a salary, and send them from town to town to propagate music, to propagate such beautiful lyrics. Purandar Dasa in the 16th century says, Badavan Adarinu Vijati Adarinu. Doesn't matter you are poor, doesn't matter you belong to other caste. Once you sing well, you can see the divinity. That's what he says. Karnataka is a state with strong traditions of Karnataka and Hindustani music. Yep. What is the tradition of their interaction between one another? Well, in fact, uh, again, I should thank Indian Railways <laughs> for both the systems flourishing in Karnataka. The root cause being the wires of Mysore. Uh, they were great patrons of music. All this Vainai Seshana, Subbanna, Vaste Vasha, this uh, very popular song. Uh, what is that? In the film Shankara Varam, was that song. Broche Varu was written by Vaste Vasha, who was a court musician in Mysore. So, the Mysore kings invited musicians from Baroda. Those were the trace, uh, days of meter gauge train to take three, four days for the uh, artists to reach Mysore from Baroda. So they would break their journey in Hubli, Dharwad, Belgaum. The local landlords uh, supported them, they encouraged them. That's how Hindustani music uh, and Carnatic music both grew in Karnataka. That's the historical and cultural reason. And Ustad Abdul Karim Khan Sahab, uh, who also learned Carnatic music in Mysore court has sung Ramani Samana Mevaru. You can probably take a note of that and listen to it on the show. So there's a lot of give and take between both the musicians. Systems of both, both Karnataka and Hindustan, a lot of exchange between them. How do you see the relationship of music as an art with other arts, visual, etc.? Is there any synergy with creative arts? Can we have some examples? And related to this only, another question. How do you see the relationship of music and society? Can there be dichotomy between these? Can you have music not influenced by society? Both are interrelated, of course, though in a very... See, that's what I told you in the beginning. Musicians do not come from a different planet. That's part one. Music also has not come from a different planet either. Okay. A lot of ragas, uh, they originate from folk music. Uh, Kumar Gandharva Pandit Kumar Gandharva who is originally from Karnataka who lived in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, when he had tuberculosis, he was advised five years of rest, absolute rest, absolute silence. So he went to Nook and corner of the Madhya Pradesh and listened to the folk music of uh, Madhya Pradesh and fine-tuned them and made them into several ragas. I will sing one tune for you. Thank you, see. Does this evoke in you, my dear sir? Any one of you can answer. Yeah. Ask a, a question. What yeah. kind of emotions are they do they evoke in us? The raga that is. Uh, okay, okay. What kind of emotion did it evoke in you? So Gayatri has answered with longing, sir. Longing. Absolutely. Absolutely mm -hmm. right. This is called as Raga Mandara. Mandara is also the name of a flower, that's part one. So Nindanai, this is basically a folk tune which has become a classical raga. So there is so much of give and take between the society and the classical music also has blossomed in society. It has not come from a different planet. I only wish I had, we all had more time to explain the nuances of how society and musicians are an integral part. Yeah, go ahead. Next, next question quickly. Yes, sir, there is. Another question is, what are some initiatives taken by Indian musicians and organizations to promote the preservation and synthesis of different regional music traditions? And we're related to this only. For average audience, music has become Bollywood. 
how does synthesis and diversity work in music in view of this reality uh, that's a very very valid question even as a uh, as a practitioner of classical musician according to me which uh, crosses all linguistic and geographical borders uh, i wish uh, uh, the musicians are invited more and more to educate people it's it's not a professional uh, requirement Uh, way back in 1978, when Balmuli Krishna sang in my native place, Hospet, Bellary district, uh, somebody asked, "Sir, we can't afford your fees. Why, why can't you come more frequently?" He said, "If the government ensures me of my day-to-day -day requirements, I'll sing every day, everywhere, wherever you want." Okay. So therefore, a musician is also a human being who has to look after his day-to-day -day requirements. I will tell you one more thing. Yes, uh, there was one guru. Uh, purposely, the name of the guru is kept secret. Uh, this anecdote again goes back to by 40-50 years. He was teaching a lot of students selflessly. So they were all young students. One was in eighth grade, one was in tenth grade, etc., etc. They learned for about 10 years. One became a doctor, one became an engineer, one became a professor, etc. They still continued their passion with music. So one fine day they realized. So as you people are asking, what is the contribution of the musician to the society and the vice versa? All these uh, socially responsible citizens and students, they thought, we have to immortalize the name of my guru, our guru. How shall we do it? So then they have a discussion among themselves and then they come to a conclusion. We'll make a marble statue of our guru and erect it right in front of the railway station. Those st This railway station and the bus, bus stand were the important places of the town. Airport was not too many. Were not too many. They said, "Okay, it's wonderful. Anybody who gets out of the train and they come out of the railway station, they see the statue. Who is it? 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 He says those days around twenty-five thousand marbles, then his sculpting charges, the erection, etc., etc. But the guru is still alive. He is not dead, so they have to seek his permission. They go to the guru and ask him, sir. Then when all the students come together, he asks them, "Are you all sab log ikatta aage? So I can teach you. All sab dusre dusre raag seek rahe hain. They all are in different ragas. One is singing Malkans, one is singing Chandrakans." When he's singing Madhu comes, so I'm actually I will teach him. One thing is that no, 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 sir, we have not come for learning. We have come for a discussion. What is the discussion, sir? You have been such a wonderful teacher. We want to immortalize your name. So we have come to a decision. What is it? How are we going to immortalize the name, sir? We have decided we are going to erect your statue made out of marble in front of railway station. He thinks for a while. Now, dear Kabeeta, you are all just blossoming into your professionals. Why do you want to do all this? It's been an expensive affair. Don't do it. And they said, Sir, we are not asking money from you. We are asking only for your permission. We have arranged for the cash and all the stuff. So you just give us permission. Then he'll say, How much does it cost? Twenty-five thousand rupees. Then he will close his eyes for another five seconds and then say, Look, my dear. What you are planning to spend? Give one fourth of that to my wife. She will take care of my kitchen. She will take care of my health. She will take care of my children, and I will teach you much more and many, many more ragas. And if you still want to satisfy your ego, I will come and stand in front of the railway station during the daytime, whether it is along with my tampura, even if it is raining or a scorching sun. I will come and sing for you in the morning. Obviously, my name will become immortal when you sing, not the other way around. So we have seen such gurus also. There have been very, very selfless. Uh, there have been very many selfless teachers. So they can go to any corner of the country. They can propagate music. They can uh, relate music to the diversity and its uh, universalness. So this is how the music is meant to be propagated, not Bollywood or not necessarily stuck to an auditorium. It doesn't matter where you sing, whether you're singing in Albert Hall or on the streets. Ab kya gaate hain, wo mainna rakta hai, not the auditory.
this way. Probably I'll take one question and I have to leave. Yes, sir. How has globalization impacted the synthesis and diversity of Indian music? Well, uh, incidentally, uh, whether we liked it or not, we were uh, ruled by the Britishers for close to two centuries. So the impact of Western music on Indian music, more so on Indian film music, has been enormous. To the extent, I think, Ilaya uh, Raja, the South Indian music director, was called upon to conduct a, a Philharmonic Orchestra. Um, but the Westerners learning Indian classical music and achieving mastery over that is relatively less. Uh, you can quote the name of Higgins Bhagavatar, and there are some names here and there. But uh, Pandit Ravi Shankarji made an enormous work. He worked with uh, Yehudi Menon and uh, Ustad Ali Akbar Khan Saab established a school in California. Ustad Jakir Hussain has established a school in the West. Uh, in my own capacity, uh, I have traveled to the US for about 20 times. Uh, I have taught in several universities uh, or music. So there's a lot of give and take between uh, Indian music and Western music. But I would definitely repeat the entire universal music is in seven notes. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, sa, re, gamma, pa, da, That's it. C major scale of Western music is Rav Shankara Paranagiya. And C minor scale of Indian music is, uh, I mean, the C minor scale of Western music is Rav Kirwadi. That's it. Sir, last question, even though it is a very important, I mean, it is important, that is why I request you to take this, uh, not exactly question, you are, uh, please suggest a piece of music or song that yeah. motivates all of us for plantation that can unit, uh, all of, unite all of us in the current climatic situation. Plantation of uh, maybe this good idea of unity should be given the top priority. Somebody would like... Uh, you have to suggest uh, some sort of uh, talisman uh, like music uh, which can unite it, people. I don't know. But for one more thing is there, sir. Uh, how does how did the name Havaldar uh, get appended to you in the sense of normally place names are uh, appended? There is one more question which Gagarin has left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was 12 kilometers away from Hampi. 12 kilometers away from Hampi. And when we dug out the records of our ancestors, uh, the surname Havaldar was the administrative rank in the Vijayanagara Empire. That's it. I, I don't know how to hold a gun. I only know how to hold a thought for it. Okay. Uh, the first question, sir, unity. So one uh, theme of music or, uh, which can promote unity. or. That is, uh, that was tuned by my guru. Uh, that's the only example I'm giving you, like this. Mm -hmm. so I started from Malaysia Mera Tumara and went across to Hindi songs only because uh, you may be familiar with those songs. They were all based on Rag Bhairavi of Hindustan style and Sindhu Bhairavi of Carnatic music. There are so many ragas like Rag Mohana, Malkams, Hindoda, Durga. Uh, incidentally, though music has therapeutic value, I can definitely vote for that. Crossing the paracetamol for uh, fever, then brufen for uh, knee pain. I cannot prescribe a raga for a particular ailment. Listen to good music, society will live harmonious. That's my prayer and request. Thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot, Am sir. Pardon? Th thanks a lot, sir. Thanks a lot.
Thank you. Any other feedback, you can email it to me. I'll try to get back to you. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, good evening, madam. Uh, again, in fact, uh, Sar would have been there after yeah. till your speech is over. But in any case, he has got some other work. Yes. Uh, good evening to ma'am again. From Saint Anne's High School, Sikandarabad, through Delhi University and JNU as student, as an academician and musician. whose experience spans teaching and research in economics development studies and popular music studies sumangala damodaran's life journey as student academic and protester against injustice he is as fascinating as formidable she has taught in delhi university and ambedkar university delhi for three decades and is presently visiting professor at ashoka university the university of cape town and the institute Institute for Human Development, Delhi. Besides being an economist and a social scientist, she is a singer and composer. Her her archiving and documentation of the musical tradition of the Indian People's Theatre Association (IPTA) from the mid nineteen thirties to the end of nineteen fifties has resulted in a book titled "The Radical Impulse." music in the tradition of ipta and an album titled songs of protest she has also performed from the documented repertoire extensively in different parts of the country and abroad she has collaborated with poets and musicians from south africa especially with the arisitas as a founder member of the award winning insurrections ensemble which has produced six music albums and has also directed a multi institutional project around music and migration in pre colonial afro asia which has resulted in two musical productions and a wonderful book titled maps of sorrow migration and music in the construction of pre colonial afro asia her profile reminds me of dr ambedkar's slogan educate agitate and organize who can better explicate on the subject synthesis and diversity in indian music especially in the light of the present situation where protest seem to be a necessary evil over to you ma'am sumangala thanks for coming to the webinar um, thank you thank you so much uh, mr gagarin and uh, also mr ravi babu i'm you know greatly honored to be Uh, speaking to all of you who have so much experience uh, in your own fields and uh, have had illustrious careers and uh, um, of course what brings us all together i, I guess is um, a lot of concern about what is happening to our society and polity and how we all of us coming from our different backgrounds can uh, make sense of um, a lot of uh, uh you know conflict that is happening in the country which we are not so familiar with from the past uh, i mean it's india has not been a conflict free country but uh, uh, but you know what is being witnessed now um, is actually uh, leaving a lot of us uh, completely um, uh, you know uh, dumbfounded and you know groping in the dark about what has happened and so therefore um, uh, that unites all of us and that is where i would like to talk about some things uh, around music and the way in which music and musicians articulate social issues and what have been some of the trends in india over the past um, uh, you know decade decade and a half or so a little more than that uh, so um, what i'm going to talk about is about some socially responsive music repertoires from india and i hope by talking about it it will actually throw some light on uh, synthesis and diversity in indian music because um, i'll i'll start with a personal uh, anecdote uh, i'm an academician uh, primarily but i've also um, been a singer from childhood and i used to um, uh, 
you know, I used to sing what were, what are considered protest songs, basically songs which were talking about different social issues. I was um, a part of a group called Parcham, um, which used to sing, uh, which still sings um, a lot of songs around social issues, primarily in, in Delhi. And uh, one of the but I'm also, you know, I've taken training in both Carnatic and Hindustani music. I don't sing classical music, but I have, I, you know, I, I know enough about classical music and I have enough voice training to be able to understand the complexity of, of what we call India's classical traditions. And uh, as a musician, uh, you know, very often it would be very difficult for me to convince other musicians that what is called the protest song uh, is music. Because, you know, that would be dismissed. Oh, those, that's one of those protest kind of songs. It's not serious music. And um, on the other side, uh, people who were, you know, sort of part of political cultural movements very often um, did not want to accept a lot of music as socially responsive music or, you know, protest music because protest music was supposed to have a certain kind of a grammar. You know, it was supposed to be something that would sound agitational. It would play the role of mobilization in a direct kind of manner. So, um, so my uh, interest in actually looking at this whole idea of socially responsive music as a research area, and then subsequently, of course, I also started, you know, archiving and documenting a lot of socially responsive music from different parts of India and also performing uh, that music. My interest in it came from this particular kind of dichotomy. Um, so that um, what is called protest music or music that is articulating social issues in the country is also equally legitimate as music. And um, what I have tried to do over the past 15 years or so as part of my research and also performance is to actually talk about the diversity in music that articulates social concerns and to make the argument that this music also bears a continuity with our what are considered traditional uh, musical repertoires. So, uh, so after this kind of personal introduction into why I have started working on this kind of music, um, let, me, let me go to the substantial part uh, of my talk. Um, in recent years, there has been a major resurgence of socially conscious music that has responded to various social and political events that shook the conscience of musicians coming from various kinds of social and artistic backgrounds. One such event was the passing of the Citizenship Amendment Act, CAA, on December 15, 2019, after which massive protests erupted all over the country. In the months over which the protests occurred and built momentum before the pandemic put an end to gatherings, songs occupied a prominent place in the protests. Exploding in number as well as the forms of songs sung, it was as if a massive wave of pent-up energy was unleashed through the music performed at venues and events across the country. Several images from the actions of the protesters, as well as the police and the state in general, captured the imagination of artists across, in, across media. For example, and some of you might remember this, there was this very famous image that went around of a woman student wagging her forefinger in warning to a policeman who was lati charging a lot of students of Jamia Millia University. The, another image that went viral at that point was of a protesting woman student handing a rose to a policeman uh, who was actually trying to beat her up. So these images became very powerful and around a lot of these kinds of images, people wrote songs and from murals to street art to poetry and songs, voices burst through with artistic expression. So Sheetal Sathe, who's a very powerful lead singer of a group called Kabir Kala Manch, sang a song referencing the rose that I just mentioned, which uh, I'll just uh, sing two lines of that song so that you get a sense of what it uh, sounds like. <clears throat> it, uh, it goes like this. Angrezo se lade the ham, kon ye desi sahab hai? Azadi hamara wab hai, ye gulab nahi inkalab hai, ye gulab nahi inkalab hai. 
ये गुलाब नहीं इंकलाब है रफली ट्रांसलेटेड इट 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 इज वी हैड फॉट अगेंस्ट द ब्रिटिश हु इज दिस देसी वाइट मैन आजादी इज आवर ड्रीम दिस रोज इज द रेवल्यूशन नाउ द कबीर कला मंच Uh, considers itself part of what is called the Lok Shahir music tradition in Maharashtra, which emerged as the people's version of an old Shahiri or poetry song tradition. The Shahirs were medieval poet singers who travelled across the Marathi-speaking regions, singing ballads called poadas about heroism, where dramatic episodes from the mythology is very often were related through rhythmic meter and familiar refrains. would be combined with colloquial speech song so this kabir kala manch considers itself an inheritor of that musical tradition the shahid tradition which then got interpreted as a people's version of the, of the or the lok shahid tradition in the early part of the 20th century um another singer called sambhaji bhagat um, a very popular singer songwriter from maharashtra um has been at the fo- at the forefront of a cultural movement that combines this lok shahir tradition with that of bhim geet songs devoted to the legacy of baba saheb ambedkar and the dalit movement now at the same time at the time of the anti caa protests um uh, sambhaji bhagat sang um, one uh, song which went like this nahi hindu gamarla nahi muslim marla मानूस मारला मानूस मारला माझा हुसेन मारला बाया किसेन मारला मानूस मारला मानूस मारला नाइदर हिंदू हैज बीन किल्ड नॉर हैज अ मुस्लिम अ ह्यूमन बीइंग हैज डाइड अ ह्यूमन बीइंग हैज डाइड इट इज माय हुसेन हु हैज डाइड एंड आल्सो अ क्रिश्चियन हु हैज डाइड अ ह्यूमन बीइंग हैज डाइड अ ह्यूमन बीइंग हैज डाइड now uh, sambhaji bhagat's stressing of the category of manus and appealing to a larger humanism in the face of widespread violence and arrests um uh, in the months following the passing of the caa again is a part of a large repertoire over a la- long trajectory of performance by him from the 1980s onwards similarly one musical tradition that became indianized uh, became quite indigenized and also became extremely popular in these uh, as part of these protests was the rap tradition which came from uh, the Afri- african americans primarily from the united states and uh, but now uh, there are a lot of indian rappers many of whom are actually talking about very serious social issues so one example uh, is this rapper called aribu uh, from tamil nadu who is part of a music group called the castless collective he sang a song called sande sevom we will fight which also became very popular went viral on youtube um tm krishna the carnatic musician around the same period argued that india's national anthem is a protest song and sang the full poem that was written by rabindranath tagore to make his point across protest venues all over the country now what was interesting uh, in, in this period was a lot of musicians who otherwise would not have performed on the same stage for example it is difficult for us to imagine a concert in which a rapper and a carnatic musician perform one after the other but um, this response to the social ferment that was caused by the passing of the caa actually brought a lot of people a lot of musicians together in order to voice their sentiments and in order to voice their concern about what was happening in the country now where were these songs coming from what traditions were they drawing from what was new how can we look at the more recent trends in socially conscious music in in terms of the way in which a new imaginary has unfolded in artistic imagination and artistic practice in india what i have argued in my own work is that this is part of a process that involves a continuity with the past from the late colonial period so these trends in actually articulating social issues through music through diverse music traditions is something that took root in the late colonial period in india from the late 1930s or so um, uh, where uh, it became um, uh, it became a part of a big movement to actually articulate 
anti-colonial and anti-fascist sentiments uh, through art. Uh, and you know, in my own work has been on music. So political aesthetic questions started being asked by musicians, resulting in all kinds of extremely diverse and unique repertoires of music. Um, now, I won't talk about the colonial period and the immediate post-independence period uh, now. I'll talk about the period from the mid 1980s or so. Uh, which provide the specific background to the kind of music that I just described uh, earlier. From the mid 1980s or so, an era was inaugurated that was to throw up important cultural questions that have become particularly marked in the last decades in three decades in Indian history, of which the communalism question and the caste question were crucial. Since the late 1980s, a large corpus of music came to be created, interpreted, and performed around these questions, challenging and at the same time shaping popular sensibilities in different languages and in different parts of the country. Ubiquitously referred to as Mandal Mandir politics, the rise of majoritarian Hindutva on the one hand and the anti-caste movements on the other, along with waves of communal conflagrations and violence against Dalits over the decades, from then on, saw a lot of interesting trends in literature and music. Um, concerns with questions of nation, heritage, tolerance, and secularism led music musicians such as Shubha Mudgal, Dhruv Sangari, Madan Gopal Singh, the Kabir Project, to name a few among many, to begin studying and performing repertoires that were excavated from the past, often from centuries before. Now, we also heard. Uh, 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 Pandit uh, Nagaraj Garu actually referring uh, to his own work uh, where he is actually singing uh, you know music of the past from the 12th century onwards so there has been a proliferation of musicians who have actually thought deeply about what music from the past means and in today's context where the past is being used as a way to actually beat people down or to silence people um, this kind of an intervention, according to me, has been very important. So a vast corpus of such music, of which a large part is from Sufi and Bhakti traditions from the 12th century onwards, has come to address questions of nation, identity and politics in a refreshing manner, uh, where they have actually tried to challenge a lot of the xenophobic assertions frontally. And they've also become very popular. Uh, you know, so so even the popular media, for example, has taken to Sufi and Bhakti music in a very, very kind of accepting way. And so therefore, it has also gone out of small niche audiences to actually impact the public sphere very substantially. Now, Madan Gopal Singh, who has been one of the most um, prominent musicians who has been responsible for bringing the Sufi music tradition as well as its aesthetic and philosophical dimensions into discussions on the contemporary, has sung, excavated and sung the poetry of Shah Hussein, Sultan Bahu, Bulle Shah, um, as part of his search for lineages of the contemporary. Shubha Mudgal, a consummate classical musician, another key figure in this excavation of traditional forms, has produced a vast repertoire of songs from medieval mystic texts like the Vaishnava Pushti Marg poets, Malik Muhammad Jaisi's Padmavat, Mirabai and Tulsi Das, Nirguna poetry of Kabir and Namdev, Sufi poetry from Amir Khusro, and also from the 87 Mutiny, Faiz Ahmed Faiz, and many more contemporary poets. The Kabir project, initiated by Shabnam Birmani, herself a performer, involves, among a range of activities, a putting together of music from different parts of India that reveals the variety of musical forms uh, that perform the 15th century poet Kabir's poetry. So, uh, uh, more recently, T.M. Krishna has challenged caste hierarchies in the Carnatic music tradition, even as he has performed within the tradition and also composed and performed less, lesser known poetry, such as by Sri uh, Narayana Guru uh, from Kerala and also contemporary poets like Perumal Murugan, uh, from Tamil Nadu. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Sambhaji Bhagat, C. Sheetal Sathe have emerged as very important songwriter musicians from the Lok Shahir tradition in Maharashtra. 
which emerged as the people's version of the older Shahiri tradition. So what I'm trying to say um, uh, over here is that there have been a whole range of extremely interesting initiatives like this. Uh, what these musicians uh, argue or present through their performances is that Indian history has a lot to offer that can critique the present or present or, or, or in fact demonstrate a tolerant view of the present, for the present. Um, so um, it is possible through music to offer an alternative to the contradictions and the predilections of the present. Um, Old poetic and musical repertoires can be tapped to tease out secular principles, critiques of the caste system, to make appeals for humanism and peace in the present. So, um, you know, there, there is a sociologist called uh, Michael Denning who has argued that you there are elements from the usable past that can be used in order to address questions in the present. So, um, as a singer and composer myself, I've been interested in this whole idea uh, that how can performance itself become a way in which we go back to history and we tease out progressive principles from our history and actually present it in the present okay in a way in which we can actually intervene uh, uh, in the present um, so so this is an idea that i wanted uh, to to put across over here uh, so that you know we could take it up for further discussion. What I'm trying to say is that this whole question of looking at our older traditions has been a very important one for progressive musicians to and who are very um, classically trained, um, uh, you know, who who are very steeped in what is called the Indian musical tradition to actually ask serious questions about what is the meaning of nation, what is the meaning of tradition. What is the meaning of music that can talk about social life? So um, uh, I find that this is therefore a very powerful alternative that is available for the difficulties that we are experiencing in the present. Now, this is only one set of examples uh, that I gave, which is about musicians who have gone into the past. There's also other kinds of music. Um, so, so for example, um, I, uh, you know, I'll just say a little bit more about what these musicians say. Madan Gopal Singh, the Sufi musician, says that the Sufi kind of music, according to his interpretation, allows for freedom from convention and tradition. And this becomes a liberating and empowering asset in performance. So, for example, when he performs from the Punjabi Sufi uh, tradition, which he has been researching for two or three decades now, um, he also combines it with uh, other kinds of poetry. So for example, he there is a composition of his where he, he combines Sufi singing along with a Punjabi version of um, uh, Imagine. Uh, so uh, in order to talk about um, peace and about harmony. Um, Dhruv Sangari, uh, who is a Kavali singer, uh, says that musically the Kavali form gives you so much license, uh, you can put anything in it. I can put in any language, genre, style, any tune, any song. Uh, however, I know the tradition, I respect my master, I respect the style, I follow the tradition, follow it on and, and pass it on to the next generation. But still, I also use the flexibility of the form to actually bring in newer kinds of ideas. Um, so um, similarly, Shubha Mudgal has noted, Shubha Mudgal herself, who is quite a devout person, uh, has noted that it is possible to sing bhakti or Sufi music, which are religious forms, without necessarily a belief in God. You could be a believer, you might not be a believer. However, when you sing Sufi music or when you sing Bhakti music, you sing respecting the norms of that tradition. Okay, And it is possible for you to convey Bhakti or the philosophy of Sufism without 
even by being an atheist, if you want. So, uh, and this is there, this is very much part of the Indian tradition. Uh, you know, it's not, uh, so images that are drawn from both Hinduism and Islam, from mythology, uh, become a very compelling way of engaging with questions of intercommunity relationships. So, um, so therefore, um, musicians are actually using musical performance and, you know, their own training and their own um, um, uh, exposure to different kinds of music to actually um, uh, bring in their own interpretation of the present. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll stop with this, but I could be giving more examples. Perhaps what we can do is to actually uh, take up discussion. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Mom. Uh, there are uh, some questions. Yeah. Can you give examples of resistance music in classical genre, maybe with some rendition? Yes. Um, well, as I said, I'm I'm not a I'm not a classical musician, uh, so I I um, but then um, there there are uh, uh, I I need to think a little bit, but I can I can give some examples from my research. Um, you know, one of the people who was very active in the Indian People's Theatre, two people, in fact, who were very active in the Indian People's Theatre Association, who were well-known classical musicians, were Ravi Shankar and um, um, Ali Akbar Khan. In the early days of the Indian People's Theatre Association, uh, in the 1940s, before independence, in Bombay. Now, um, what people like Ravi Shankar being in the IPTA, I mean, and not just Ravi Shankar, there were several others who were you know, classically trained. Um, what they did was to actually create songs for the freedom movement um, with a lot of songs which, which were quite radical and you know, marked a bit of a departure from the mainstream nationalist movement using uh, classical ragas. So, um, so one song that Ravi Shankar uh, uh, composed uh, was called Jaga Desh Hamara Jaga. Uh, Jaga Desh Hamara. I'll sing a small part of it. It's not strictly a classical composition, but you will be able to make out how um, uh, you know it, it's influenced strongly by uh, a classical tradition. So um, this is how it goes. Jaga Desh Hamara, Jaga Jaga Desh Hamara, Jaga Desh Hamara, Jaga Jaga Desh Hamara. गूंज उठा है हर कोने से आजादी का नारा ये सदियों का बहता पानी टूटा जल की धारा टूटा जल की धारा जागा देश हमारा जागा जागा देश हमारा अब दिस इज अ टिपिकल काइंड ऑफ अ नेशनलिस्ट सॉन्ग दैट यूज्ड टू बी सांग व्हिच वर वेरी स्ट्रांगली इन्फ्लुएंस्ड बाय द रागा ट्रेडिशन सो यूजुअली दे वुड बी बेस्ड ऑन वन रागा और द अदर and there are any number of examples uh, like this uh, which are there uh, i don't know whether that really answers the question but uh, uh, yeah what are the challenges and benefits of cross cultural collaborations in indian music particularly in terms of synthesizing diverse musical styles actually last time it was asked once again it was raised right um so uh, yes i have uh, you know worked with uh, musicians from um, from you know different countries in africa and i've also worked with musicians from china um and uh, uh, you know i don't like the term fusion uh, in the sense that because i think fusion is a term that uh, sometimes actually um, you know, underplays the kind of effort that happens when musicians from different cultures sit together and produce uh, music. <clears throat> now, um, uh, what happens when there is collaboration between musicians is that one actually discovers that musical language really allows us to communicate across borders very effectively. Of course, what does also happen is that you 
realize what the differences are with other cultures as well. So very often something that is not allowed in our tradition is something that might be uh, getting performed in another tradition. But then when people actually sit together, um, even something that is not allowed in, in a certain tradition gets loosened up and you uh, can uh, uh, create newer styles which become another kind of music. And so it, it's, there is a, this organic kind of relationship that occurs if one is willing to open up. Is it because there is a certain universal language to music and that universal language allows musicians to communicate with each other in uh, a way in which, um, you know, borders cannot imprison us. So, um, so uh, in, in that sense, I think cross-cultural collaboration becomes a very interesting exercise. And so it's not just that I'll sing my thing, you sing your thing, uh, let us sing together. But it is that how do I listen to your music? It becomes more, more than actually performing to each other. It actually becomes about listening to each other. How seriously do we listen to the other? And when we, I think, listen to the other, that also allows us to listen to difference and listen to dissent. Uh, so cross-cultural collaboration through music, I think, can become an extremely powerful way in which societies speak with each other. And in my own experience, uh, I have found this kind of cross-cultural collaboration to be a very rich pedagogical and um, uh, you know kind of social tool in order to be able to communicate with other societies. Uh, one more question is, any comments on the Varkari movement of Maharashtra? The, this uh, questionnaire feels that uh, music experts from all over the country are somehow restrained uh, from spreading it to the common public, but films and commercial music has really touched the soul of common man. Any comments? The same uh, questionnaire asking, since rap is catching on very quickly with uh, Gen Z, I don't know exactly. I do not no, no, there, uh, these are three different people ask three different questions. Okay, okay, then it is fine. I thought uh, you said... the Varkari moment is different, and uh, other two questions, I just copied and pasted them. Okay, the okay. Then uh, these three questions we have to deal separately. Any comments yeah. on the Varkari movement of Maharashtra? Yeah, um, I am not familiar with it. I'm not unfortunately, familiar with I'm sorry, but I, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Varkari yeah. tradition, as you have just suggested, the uh, Madam uh, Mudgal, how she is uh, trying to revive the old uh, egalitarian musical movement, uh, wherein all the people, I mean, all these people are telling all human beings are equal. Mm. Uh, Varkari is basically peripatetic teaching. Uh, that one, anyway, that we need not to worry. No? Uh, yes. Second one is, I feel that music experts from all over the country are somehow restrained from spreading it to the common public. But films and commercial music has really touched the soul of common man. Any comments? Yeah, of course. I mean, films and uh, commercial uh, media, um, you know, reach millions and millions of people very easily. Uh, whereas, you know, either an expert or even an individual musician without the help of uh, commercial media very often finds it very difficult to reach uh, the public. Um, but then, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that I did mention in my talk was this alternative musical repertoires that I'm talking about, they've also become often commercially successful. Uh, so uh, so there, is a, there is a connection between what is happening with small audiences, but also often they just get picked up by the, by the commercial media or by by films or whatever it is and they become popular so uh, so in the uh, 1940s for example musicians of the ipta took a very not just musicians but you know poets and uh, actors and so on balraj sahani and sahil udhyanvi and all these people took a very con uh, you know conscious decision to to actually join commercial cinema uh, in order to be able to spread a message of dissent uh, so, yes, of course, um, you know, they, they are a very powerful way of getting across, but then for that reason, they can also, you know, put across all kinds of uh, messages, including xenophobic ones. 
Um, as far as rap is concerned, uh, uh, yes, I think rap has already emerged as a very important genre that is reaching, you know, millions and millions of people and young people are responding to it. And what is interesting about what is happening to rap in India is that a lot of rappers are actually calling it an Indian genre. Uh, you know, so it's not just about imitating what is what happened uh, in the West, but but a lot of, uh, I know there are rappers from Tamil Nadu and Kerala, for, for example, who are using, you know, indigenous traditions to work out uh, rap songs. So definitely rap is going to be uh, very influential. Who are the key poets today who are speaking out against the current divisive and oppressive politics? Mm. Um, again, I mean, I can't claim to be an expert, you know, in terms of uh, giving a list. I I, um, I can say in specific languages, there are some very um, uh, powerful poets. Um, in Hindi, for example, I mean, these are, I'm talking about people that I know and, you know, I, I'm familiar with. Uh, in Hindi, there is... Um, Somebody called, called Anshu, two, two poets called Anshu Malviya and Soumya Malviya uh, from, who come from Allahabad. Uh, a former colleague of mine, um, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm missing his name. But uh, so it, I mean, Hindi, there's a, there's a whole range of uh, very interesting uh, poets. Ma, you know, this poet called Manglish Dabral passed away a couple of years ago. He was extremely prolific and extremely powerful. In Kerala, you have, uh, you know, in the older generation, you have people like uh, K. Sachidanandan, who continue to write very uh, uh, powerful poetry. You have people from the younger generation, uh, uh, Sabita Sachidanandan, Anwar Ali, Anita Tampi. Uh, like this, I'm sure, you know, there are lots of uh, very powerful poets who are actually writing socially responsive uh, poetry in different parts of the country. Many of you might know much better, you know, from, from your own uh, parts of India. Revival of the past, just you told Madam uh, Mudgal, revival of past purportedly egalitarian or traditions of protest music seems good. Yet, uh, aren't all these music uh, saying that all humans are equal in the eyes of God and all humans are equal whether God or Shastra say or not? Isn't such idea status quoist? Um, I, I'm, I don't understand why it should be status quoist. Uh, I mean, I think what the uh, that all humans are equal in the eyes of God, and all humans are equal whether God or Shastra say or not. Uh, I, I'm not able to understand. Maybe if the See, question... all these people claim. Yeah. God or Shastra says all humans are equal in the eyes of God. Right, right. But for example, if some Shastra says all humans are not equal like Manushastra, then the very purpose of quoting and then say, singing these songs, will it not become status quoist? I Okay, okay. Yeah, no, which is why, um, you know, there, there is this whole idea of the usable past. You know, in the sense that it is it, you know, the, the past has also been equally oppressive or e equally problematic, right? So, um, but at the same time, what we are saying is that our past, there, there's not a single past. There are several pasts. So what out of, what elements from the past that does one actually pull out in order to talk about ideas of equality, humanism, and so on? Uh, so the, the the bhakti movement itself came into existence. A lot of the bhakti poets were actually uh, talking about an intimate relationship with God because they were not permitted to perform in you know uh, uh, into temples or you know they, they were they were oppressed by caste and so many uh, different kinds of uh, social structures. So, however, so so what in the past can we actually look at? Um, there there is enough in the past which was status quo at that time. There is enough in the present which is status quoist, and the status quo can be extremely oppressive. So these repertoires that I'm talking about are but questioning things in their time. And so what these musicians are trying to do is to say that there's not just a singular view of the past. We do have a long history of tolerance. We do have a long history of coexisting 
we would even if we have had troubled societies so the point is about what i you know referred to as the usable past and who uses what part of the past to say what social media is available to all why are classical musicians keeping away from the social media is there some elitism there maybe unconscious or covert uh i don't think classical musicians are keeping away from social media a large number of classical musicians are very active on social media uh so uh in fact um you know not just on facebook and all of that but i think even on instagram and so on i've seen a lot of classical musicians quite active so as uh, uh as uh, uh pandit nagaraj ji said uh musicians are not some other creatures <laughs> musicians are are like any other person in society so if there are enough people in society who keep away from social media music you know some musicians will also always keep also keep away from social media but i do know a large number of musicians who are extremely active classical musicians who are extremely active on social media ravi are there any questions have i missed no uh, i would like to ask madam's response uh, to some of the questions posed to pandit nagaraj would you like to respond to any of those questions madam because there would be of lot of interest to you also especially the interaction between different traditions and uh, music systems or uh, so you anything you would like to respond in those questions yeah there is a chat box also ma'am you can see yes yes i'm um, yeah um yeah there's somebody who's asked can you have music not influenced by society um you know i don't think so uh you know because uh, i mean music might be abstract you might actually have examples of extremely abstract music uh, which perhaps uh, you know reflect certain kinds of philosophical positions or purely you know aesthetic um say experiments uh, or aesthetic uh, you know kind of uh, uh, principles being reflected in music but even that would come out of a particular kind of social structure uh, and as long as musicians are embedded or any any human beings are embedded in society i don't think one can actually talk about music which is not um uh, influenced by society um there's another uh, uh what are some initiatives taken by indian musicians and organizations to promote and the preservation and synthesis of different uh, regional music traditions i mean there are any number uh so um, i mean one is of course historically uh, especially post independence uh, in india the state itself has played quite an important role in um, in you know preserving and working with different regional music traditions all india radio is one of the richest archives that one can think of um uh, and also uh, any number of foundations or uh, even um in in so so for example musicians depending upon which part of the country they come from um, are also involved with preservation and synthesis of different music traditions that they come from so even as part of music schools or music teaching or gharanas for example these are also efforts to actually preserve different kinds of uh, regional music traditions um yeah i think uh, yes okay no i thought there was one more question that was a comment only yeah okay okay no okay. uh, it's done madam yeah by and large all the questions are over thanks a lot uh, maybe one uh, this globalization impact on synthesis and diversity of indian music maybe you could respond on how it has uh, shaped up the protest movements especially in different forms because i think uh, the lot of uh, protest movements drew from uh, glo- various uh, events globally yes um you- yes of course i mean if we actually look at the uh, you know the the early part of the 20th century uh, although it was not that time was not termed globalization there was a great deal of internationalism in terms of articulating um uh you know social concerns through music 
so uh, as i said earlier um, you know the fight against fascism uh, and the fight against colonialism brought musicians from different parts of the world together uh, so there was what was called an um, uh, you know anti fascist uh, front um, uh, which was formed um, in the uh, 1930s uh, and which then became uh, you know the, the peace movement by the 1950s after the second world war so even before the 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 era of globalization as we know it there has been a lot of internationalization or internationalism in musical traditions in more recent times say over the past 30 years or so of course globalization in the way in which we know it today has been very important in the way in which music gets disseminated um so so one of the most uh, fascinating examples from our own um recent experience is what happened at the time of the big farmers movement um in fact that one can actually see you know globalized the pinnacle of globalization and it's getting reflected in in protest music so um at the time when the farmers came and um, uh, you know marched to delhi and and set up uh, their camps uh, you know at two or three different points just outside delhi within a matter of two weeks or so about 800 or 1000 songs had been written new songs had been written and these were being written by people uh, by uh, pr primarily from punjab and haryana who were all over the world and who were actually recording songs highly professionally putting them up on social media coming and performing them at the protest venues and um, galvanizing the farmers movement on the basis of these songs to a great extent so that is one of the most amazing examples that one can find so what happened was that musicians who were actually very popular themselves you know who uh, who already um, had um, you know uh, 2 million and 3 million views on their songs uh, the moment they established the solidarity with the farmers movement suddenly the views went up to 8 or 9 million in a single day so uh that is one of the best examples of globalization uh, that i can think of and its impact on um uh, uh, impact on um um uh, music and music which responds to social issues uh, similarly a lot of musicians today are taking to internet platforms uh, to disseminate their music um so um yeah i mean despite a lot of problems with globalization it has been a very important a uh, phenomenon in the dissemination of socially responsive music in fact uh, uh, jaydeep kaliya has requested you mom you should be more active on social media <laughs> well yeah i yeah i just get a bit lazy <laughs> mom a small uh, doubt oh. since you are in the protest uh, movement yes the existing situation he is not very conducive to any protest both government communal elements reactionary elements and all people put together uh, i should say tend to if not completely oppressing the sort of uh, protest music or any type of protest yeah in your experience this sort of uh, oppression yeah. is further uh, infusing some sort of perseverance in the uh, protesters or it is dampening the movement mm. yeah um well you know this is a very important question and um, um so i think both are happening both are happening because um um i mean i myself have a lot of experience in this regard so the music that i perform by i don't consider dangerous by any standards uh you know these are songs that come from our freedom movement these are songs that come from uh various uh different kinds of traditions it's just that, that these are songs that talk about social issues but i myself have had this experience when um i've been invited often to places to perform uh, there are people you know the authorities from various institutions who are worried um and uh, you know there are also threats that come from there have been instances where where there has been disruption and uh, you know quite scary kinds of incidents as well so uh, um so if people uh, feel dampened it's not uh, you know it's not their fault because the situation is quite scary uh, but on the other hand uh, as i said i mean in the in the midst of the pandemic 
in the midst of uh, you know highly repressive conditions during the farmers movement music exploded uh, so people people also persevere uh, but these are very tough times Yeah. madam you may like to respond to one more question madam which was uh, addressed to pandit nagaraj rao ji uh, yes. shakespeare's midsummer night's dream extols the intrinsic ability of music to influence our feelings and moods in his lines if music be the food of love play on how can we harness this extraordinary attribute of music to spread love and brotherhood in our society populated with people of diverse faiths and beliefs yeah um uh, well this is precisely what uh, a lot of people are doing you know that that music goes beyond communicates in ways that uh, that are quite unprecedented um so uh, as i've said in my own experience i've had i mean i can give you enough examples um, of situations where even if the audience was hostile very often just singing a particular song or relating a particular story around the creation of a song has been a way in which i have been able to communicate with people who also been quite hostile uh, so as long as somebody is willing to listen i mean if you're not willing to listen if you get violent there's nothing that anybody can do but as long as even i mean someone doesn't agree with an idea of yours um as long as that people are willing to listen to the way in which a song is being conveyed um it it's something that can actually be quite magical and you know i myself have had a lot of these experiences and uh, and uh, so have a lot of people some of whose names uh, i have mentioned so uh, uh, so music can have that extraordinary effect and uh, uh, that's what a lot of people are trying you know music for peace music for harmony uh, music for uh, larger humanism and so on can you give some personal examples if you don't mind madam one or two just a, an example or a two or so yeah um so um i can yeah i can talk about uh, uh one example uh so there is a song that i um um uh, found as part of my research it is a forgotten song from the freedom movement um uh, you know it's a song that was written after the jallianwala bagh massacre and that song um was written by an unknown poet but musicians of the ipta found that song and used to sing it in the bombay central squad uh, and at that time there was a singer um, called preeti sarkar uh, who at that time ravi shankar apparently had said that she's one of the best singers in india um and uh, so she used to sing this song and when i was doing my research she was somebody who was in her 80s by then i had the good fortune of meeting her in in kolkata and she taught me the song now this is a song uh, that was written after jallianwala bagh as i said but uh, even today it's a song every time i sing it it resonates with our context um, you know uh, very strongly uh, so i've had this experience with this song uh in delhi university for example in, in a large number of colleges where i've i've performed 2016 2017 um there would be people who uh you know who would say that uh you know you are not allowed to perform anti national music uh so i used to sing this song and i've had the most cussed and most um uh, you know uh, dogmatic of people actually coming and uh, uh you know weeping at the end of that song and actually saying what you're saying is true you know so in in a situation where there are very tough kind of um uh, you know uh, borders created between in, in through conversations i've had this experience of you know singing songs and being able to break that barrier uh, so this is this is one example that i i like to mention um i can sing a few lines of that song to uh, you know so that you get a sense of uh, what i'm talking about <clears throat> it's called din khoon ke hamare pyare na bhool jana din khoon ke hamare pyare na bhool 
जाना खुशियों में अपने हम पर आंसू बहा के जाना दिन पूर्ण के हमारे सयाद ने हमारे चुन चुन के फूल तोड़े वीरान इस चमन ने अब गुल खिला के जाना दिन पूर्ण के हमारे This is just one part of that song. Great, very nice. Ravi, anything you would like to say? No, you can close up with a word of thanks. Yeah. Uh, the, what about the next uh, seminar? Also, we have to announce. No? Yeah, that is impact of uh, recent policies and industrialization. Ah, um, that you can announce. Thanks a lot, ma'am. In fact, it is a, a highly elevating experience this evening. uh uh dr nagraj ra also could have been together it should have been nice but in any case it is very good uh, you have waited and then you have uh, very patiently answered all the questions uh, we are very happy in fact uh, we were worried uh, how this will turn out uh, but this, <laughs> this has turned out very good uh we are also interested in uh, conducting one more on uh, similar lines maybe somewhere in around october or uh, november we may come to you for some assistance so kindly yeah. help us uh, wherever it is possible and similarly whatever may be the uh, other webinars uh, we conducted uh, many webinars kindly put also across your students uh, and many of your uh, uh, friends etc so that uh, whatever may be we are trying to we should not say exactly ours is a protest movement but definitely we are trying to infuse some sort of sense in the minds of the people who are supposed to be we should not say and bhakt or whatever it may be that pejorative word but definitely some sort of thing is there we are trying to infuse some sense so kindly help us to put across all these webinars across your students your friends and your groups yeah definitely thank you so much for inviting me yeah thanks a lot ma'am and thanks to uh, dr nagraj rao also thanks to our uh, advisory team because of them only we are really progressing well and thanks to our uh, technical team uh, sadik and thanks to our uh, two wonderful uh, poster makers uh, both shreya and uh, uh, joya joha Uh, next month seminar will be on uh, the last sunday of september ravi kindly tell no, the 30th of it, the webinar is will be on 30th of july so it will be addressed uh, uh, the topic will be on uh, the impact of policies of uh, industrialization having uh, having uh, have we progressed well uh, that is the topic uh, so with this we will close madam thanks uh, to all the audience that are present thank you madam